Good morning, everybody. There are a few things that a physician can tell you that are more likely to bring you to your knees in absolute desperation than the words, I'm sorry to tell you, you have cancer. 1994, I walked in to see a radiologist at a local hospital here in New Jersey, and he told me that my wife had, quote, a particularly virulent form of cancer, and he thought she had about six months to live, and he thought that he ought to let me know that so that she could put her affairs in order, to which I replied, bullshit, and I had no idea what I was talking about, but I think that word, get angry if you would, was the beginning of the preparation and the building of a plan to keep her alive that, that I hope can help other people stay alive as well. And my personal story, as many of you know, is that uh, my wife did finally pass away from an infection, but she lived for 23 years after that radiologist told me uh, that she had six months to live. So before we begin, uh, the first, the first uh, admonition I would point out to everybody is if anybody in this room or anybody who eventually listens to this uh, this presentation thinks that they're going to live forever you're excused now you have to leave the room this is not a plan to live forever it is a plan to live longer and better with cancer So what I'm going to do is present 10 steps. The first one is, and it's easier said than done, that I'm going to create, if I'm diagnosed with cancer, a blueprint for, live, for living with cancer and for living, period. I'm going to work to try to control my medical care. I'm going to negotiate timely test results. If you had an expensive automobile and a, and a mechanic gave it a diagnostic test, and you stop by at the end of the day and you say, mechanic, can you tell me how my automobile is doing? So I'll be happy to do it. Come back in two weeks and I'll let you know. You become very angry at why you had to wait two weeks to find out what was happening to your car. If you're having a CAT scan to determine whether or not you have cancer or whether that cancer is progressing, it is not reasonable and it's not acceptable for somebody to tell you, come back in a week or two, we'll read the results and let you know. Uh, in my case, uh, I had an understanding with my wife's radiologist, <clears throat> literally, that he had 20 minutes to take me in the back and tell me my wife's CAT scan results, or call 911, because my anxiety level by that point in time was off the wall. I'm gonna allow myself to be sad. I'm gonna allow myself to be angry. I'm gonna allow myself to express my emotions. I'm gonna learn to say, and this is the most important phrase I've learned over a period of years, I understand what you're saying to me, doctor, hospital, billing clerk, it's just unacceptable. <clears throat> With all due respect, I'd like a second opinion, doctor, who do you recommend? And by the way, if you encounter a physician who's reluctant to give you a second opinion recommendation, leave the room. This is not somebody you want to spend the next couple of years negotiating with. You're prescribing a treatment, doctor. Am I going to be able to pay for it? I'm going to decline becoming a statistic. We had a member of the Life Ref group years ago when we, when we began forming uh, shortly after the year 2000, who read our data, and, and our data indicated that in X number of months, the average person who is being treated for this particular cancer, GI stromal tumor or GIST, is going to progress. And he got it into his head that, that was the moment in time at which he will progress. And he began adjusting his life, coming into our office and calling to me, it's getting closer and closer, what am I gonna do next? And what you understand is that he's not a statistic. Statistics are average. Some people are less, some people are more. But some people take statistics literally uh, and begin to live their life as if they were a statistic. I'm gonna strive to take control over my personal life I try to live a healthy lifestyle. Uh, I personally recommend chocolate being part of everybody's lifestyle. I'm going to have achievable goals. One of the things I always did when, with my wife over a period of 23 years was no matter what procedure she was going through, she always had a goal. 
And I got that from a book I read. <clears throat> it was written by a guy, he was a psychiatrist named Frankel, who wrote a book called The Meaning of Life, and he, and he wrote the book on, no, on little scraps of paper when he was an inmate, an inmate at Auschwitz concentration camp. And what he tried to figure out was why some people managed to survive those terrible horrors. And one of the essential elements was that those who survived, other than luck, which obviously is, 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 is important in a situation like that, that those who survived always had a goal. The goal might be tomorrow I'm gonna to find a piece of toast, I'm gonna to find a shoelace, but they always have a goal. My wife always had a goal, she didn't quite realize it at times, there was always some place we had to go after every procedure that she had to go through, and there were many, many procedures. I will find my spiritual and emotional center. I will seek treatment for anxiety, for depression, and for pain. I will take time out for myself. And the most difficult thing is I will try to maintain financial solvency. And I'm not going to get into an entirely separate presentation about what it takes to survive financially when somebody is diagnosed with cancer. But a cancer diagnosis uh, often bankrupts families. In fact, the leading cause of personal bankruptcy in the United States is our, our medical bills. And so trying to figure out a way to navigate the medical system takes a lot of time, a lot of effort. One thing I'll tell you right now is all insurance companies have a pyramid. The first time when they reject you and say, I will not pay for something, that's, per, that's step number one. When you appeal that step number two, almost for sure, they're gonna turn you down again. Step number three, you have a chance. Step number four, it begins to reverse. And it's a squeaky wheel type of thing uh, because most people drop out and give up as they try to work their way up the ladder. We had a personal experience at a, at a very prominent hospital in a New York metropolitan area that didn't accept our health insurance. Uh, and my wife got out of hospital with a, with a out-of-pocket bill for $215,000. And they settled eventually for nothing because we went back to them again and again. By the way, hospitals have a great deal of difficulty explaining their bills. If you keep asking why you're charging for that, why you're charging for this, and they go back again and again and again, they can't do it for the most of the time. Step two, uh, it's got to be the most important thing in the world. I will create a support network. I'm going to try to find a personal advocate that could be my caregiver. I'll try to find a specialist. And if I have a rare cancer like the ones that I deal with, GI stromal tumor, uh, what I'm going to try to figure out is who my doctor is. Easier said than done. When somebody says, who's your doctor? You're going to a local, to a specialized center, and you're seeing an oncologist. But you have a primary care physician, and you also have another medical condition that you're seeing another physician for. My wife had seven different physicians that she was seeing for, for different types of issues. And trying to figure at any point in time who is her doctor is not an easy thing to do, but it's important to try to do it. Spiritual support. Uh, we're not going to preach religion, and, the, and uh, the Life Raft group does not advocate a particular religion. Uh, it said there are very few atheists in, in foxholes in battle, and I think many people find it helpful to survive the day-to-day -day challenges of a cancer by having some sort of spiritual support and some sort of psychological support. Uh, friends, and, and, and the comment I'd like to make about friends is this. When somebody comes to you and says, I want to help you, you you've had a procedure, you've had surgery, you've had a CAT scan, uh, can I bring you dinner? Can I buy you something? Can I do something? Say yes, you're doing that person a favor. People are desperate if they're your friends to try to help you get through something. Let them do it. Let them help you. I will understand my cancer. It takes a little bit, uh, a little bit of effort. First, I'm going to try to understand where am I in the continuum of disease. Cancer is a disease that has it has a beginning, it has a middle, it goes. Unfortunately, some cases it has an end. Some take, some cases a good end, some cases not.
but figure out where are you in terms of, of the, the onset of your cancer. Check to see whether or not your original diagnosis was right. They're not always right. Learn what you need to know about the genetic profile for your disease. More and more science is marching on and we're learning more and more about different types of mutational tests that say, even though you have cancer A, you have a subtype of this cancer that will respond to this drug. Not that one, this one. Learn what, what that profile is. And if you still have a primary disease, you still have the original disease, the original tumor that, that took place in your body, it hasn't progressed, learn what your risk factors are for progression and learn how to deal with those risk factors. For some people, there are none. For some people, it is you've had surgery, go home, live your life, everything is okay. For others, there's a degree of risk, and it's on a scale, that helps to determine whether or not you're likely to have a recurrence. And if you are, what are the plans for dealing with that recurrence? And then there are a couple of resources that I want to point out. Obviously, a support group like the LifeRef group is one that uh, I feel and, uh, and my colleagues feel is important. Uh, there are two others I would point to in particular, easy to find on the internet. There's a site called PubMed, P-U-B-M-E-D. Click on Google, click PubMed, and it will bring you to the National Library of Medicine. Type in the name of your cancer. Be prepared to see 10, 20, 30,000 articles. But they're in chronological order. The most recent ones are first. Start reading. If your eyes go a little bit after a while and you begin to get confused and what have you, take a break and read again and learn about your disease. Learn about the newest treatment. And at the bottom of each article, look at where the researchers are who are writing the article. And look at what hospitals they're located in. And the second resource is that there's a site called clinicaltrials.gov, which will help you find the latest clinical trials that are available. And those may not be the trials that your local physician is recommending to you. I will advocate for the right dose of drugs. Uh, this is an interesting, uh, an interesting phenomenon that the LifeRef group became involved in uh, early on. First, I want to make a statement that it's easier to prevent drug resistance for most cancers than it is to figure out how to overcome that resistance if it occurs. So whatever one can do to prevent that resistance from, from occurring, it improves the chances of survival uh, significantly. Uh, I want the right dose of drug because I want my side effects to get better. I want to take a look at, at starting, my side of, starting my dosage at a lower level than what I need and escalating slowly so I can stay on that particular dose. And now I want to explain a very interesting phenomenon about clinical trials. And it's a concept called intent to treat. And it was something the LifeRef group learned about early on in our history. <laughs> we were tracking a drug called Gleevec, and we were tracking a clinical trial that had three dosage levels, three cohorts in the trial, 400, 600, 800 milligrams. And obviously people wanted to know which of these three dosage levels gave the greatest efficacy in terms of either tumor shrinkage or tumor stability for a particular cancer, in this case, cancer called GIS. And at the end of the first year of tracking, uh, a colleague of mine, a guy named Jerry Cole, called me up and he said, I just looked at the, at the statistics that came out from Novartis, the company that's making this drug. And what was interesting in their statistics was that the number of patients assigned to each dosage level after a year was the same as on day one and neither Jerry or I knew, understood what was going on. So we went back and tried to get a little bit smarter and we found out that if you're assigned to a dosage level, let's say you're assigned to 800 milligrams of glee, and you stay in that dosage level for a week, for two weeks, for one month, and because of the side effects, because of your inability to tolerate that drug, the physician drops your dosage level, and let's say he puts you in the 400 milligram group. Everybody got it? 
You're on 800 milligrams for four weeks, then you drop down to 400 milligrams. Let's say 18 months later you progress, your disease has progressed. We would think, Jerry and I thought, that if you were on 800 milligrams for four weeks, and for 14 out of 15 months, you were on 400 milligrams, you must have progressed on 400 milligrams. And the answer in a clinical trial is no. The concept of intent to treat is, whatever your starting dosage is, that's the dosage that you will always be linked to in terms of tracking your trial. And so we went to Novartis and we said, we don't understand what's going on. We looked at actual dosage and we found out that people on a higher dosage, 600 milligrams, seemed to be doing better. The survival was longer, progression-free survival was longer, overall survival started to appear to be longer. What's going on? And we sat down and I shared our data and I'll tell you that the, 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 the culmination of what the Life Rap group looked at and, and what we learned about the concept of actual dosage and what was the right dosage for patients. We're in Basel, Switzerland, it's a couple of years ago. The CEO of Novartis is retiring. I, I had the honor of being one of the uh, presenters at his retirement. And he turns to his audience and he said that the Life Raft Group challenged the dosage and the Life Raft Group was right and Novartis was wrong. And that was kind of a, you know the ultimate vindication that a patient organization can look at dosage. But the point is, find out what the right dosage is and find out how they calculated the dosage. I will learn to manage my side effects. Easier said than done. First of all, many side effects get better over time. So what seems intolerable on day one may be tolerable on week one and may be even better on month number one. They change over time and sometimes if you started taking your dosage at a lower dose and escalated slowly to the right dose, you could minimize the side effects from beginning in the first place. Side effect management and side effects between individuals is different. And there's a, there's a new platform on the internet, we're very proud of it, it's called CyDQ. And what we're doing is we're beginning to take a look at the side effects that individuals have and how patients report those side effects over time. You know, for example, if you look at, at, at the labels of a particular drug, it might say, it might say uh, this drug causes fatigue, and on a scale of zero to 10, it's a seven. What we're looking at is a couple of things. One, first of all, is fatigue the same for men as it is for women, for Asians as it is for non-Asians, for tall as for short, for old as for old, or do side effects differ amongst different people? And if they do, maybe we ought to learn how to, how to sort those out. And maybe if there are two drugs available and one is going to provide you with fewer side effects based upon your demographics, maybe you ought to take that particular drug. But learning how to manage the side effects over time also requires help. If you go to CyDQ, regardless of what type of cancer you have, you'll find help in the form of other patients talking about their side effects. You'll also find expert advice to help you navigate those, uh, uh, those side effects. And what we're trying to do is to develop a personalized approach towards managing side effects to match the personalized approach that exists now and that is evolving for managing actual, uh, actual treatments. Now the next slide may sound to be the silliest of all. You know, I will take my medicine. Duh. Why wouldn't you take medicine that is being given to you to treat cancer? So let me go back in time. Many, many years ago, I worked for an organization called the Centers for Disease Control. And we did a study. We wanted to find out how many patients could complete a 10-day course of oral antibiotics. And the answer was not many. The average patient got to seven or eight days. Well, if you had trouble completing 10 days of an oral antibiotic that have few or no side effects at all, why do we assume that you can complete a 365-day course of an oral cancer drug that has side effects? 
There are three major reasons why patients don't take their medicine. The most obvious one is they forgot. There are people sitting in this room that you can't see them, but I can see them. How many people sitting in the room in front of me, just so that I know, forgot to take some kind of medication in the last year or two? Raise your hand. Okay, we have a count of about half this room. People forget to take their medication. How do you not forget? There are all kinds of devices and issues on, on the market that will help you try to remember. Second, some people don't take their medication because they can't afford their medication. The current price of drugs to treat cancer are unsustainable and becoming increasingly unsustainable. What affects individuals is what are the out-of-pocket costs? And there's a dilemma right now in that many pharmaceutical companies provide assistance to patients. You want to learn what that assistance is to cover their out-of-pocket costs for a particular drug. There's a catch though, and that is as older patients approach Medicare and become eligible for Medicare, many pharmaceutical companies say, well, we're not gonna help you with your out-of-pocket costs, you're now on Medicare. Well, guess what? Medicare has this phenomenon called a donut hole. What does a donut hole mean? It means that for many middle-class and less than middle-class cancer patients, you can't afford your drugs. And the third reason that people don't take their medication is because of side effects. It just makes you feel bad certain days and you want to take a break. I will learn how to monitor my treatment. What does this mean? One, check the tests that you're being given. First of all, check the order for your tests. Make sure the checks are, that the tests are the right tests for you. Second, take a look at something that, that we begin to learn more and more about. See if there's a test available to determine the actual level of this drug in your body. Many people call these plasma level tests. Sometimes they're available, sometimes they're not. Sometimes it's helpful to understand whether or not the side effects which are too high or the efficacy which is too low could be caused because the actual dosage that you're getting doesn't represent the real dosage in, uh, in your body. Record keeping. <clears throat> Write down the questions you have for your doctor <clears throat> before your appointment. Keep a diary, get copies of every test result, operative reports, pathology reports, diagnostic reports, and then track the laboratory reports as well. So it's easy, just, you can set up a spreadsheet if you have a computer or just put it down on a pencil and paper. And the first column, put down the range, the, the normal range for a particular drug. And then put down dates. And as you go through it, indicate every time you have a blood test, what's the result of that particular test. And the remark section was something happening to you while you were taking that test. Is the reason that your creatinine level is up, uh, which might indicate that you might have a problem with, with damage to your kidneys. Uh, is it due to the drug? Is it due to something else that's happening? Write down in the remark section what's taking place. An interesting thing happened to my wife Anita and I when I started tracking ranges, uh, and I won't go into any individual hospital, but. I noticed that something was off, that, that some tests that were used to be normal were not and vice versa. And I looked at, I noticed that on the laboratory test report that the range had changed. Why did they change the range? I called the head of the laboratory, they screwed up. It was a computer error. By the way, tens of thousands of people got that screw up. They, they wound up eventually, eventually changing it. I will investigate reports of progression. Okay. So you have a tumor in your body and you're taking a drug and the report comes back, you've had a CAT scan and it says, this tumor has grown by 2.3 centimeters. And my God, my life is over. Double check it, I wanna tell you two stories. One is, let me explain what it is they're looking at. Picture a balloon. And 
the balloon represents a tumor. And let's say your drug is working, and it's working very well. And what's happening to the balloon? The balloon is getting flatter and flatter and flatter. The tumor is dying. But to somebody looking down at the tumor, as a radiologist is, it may appear that it's bigger. Why? Because it, the, the dead tissue, the necrotic tissue, may make it appear that, that may make it appear this bad. There's another reason, and I'll get into it a little more later, why you need to investigate reports of aggression. <clears throat> because sometimes they're wrong. And I'll give you a classic story that happened in the life ref group when we began. One of my members, a dear friend of mine, uh, called up and, and Norman, I've had progression, my life is over. Uh, they've called me back, they say I need surgery and what have you. And it was an interesting situation. What, what happened, I said, send us a copy of the report. And he had a CAT scan report. And there were two dates on the report. And what happened was the person reading the results reversed the dates. So what was shrinkage, okay, tumor going from five centimeters to two centimeters, if you reverse the date, it looked like it went from two centimeters to five centimeters. And once we sorted that out, we found out he wasn't having progression at all. In fact, he was doing fine. By the way, another patient at the same hospital, which, which you shall go uh, nameless, also got a call back. In her case, it was easier to figure out. They had mi mixed up her CAT scan report with that of another patient. And once I got that straightened out, it turns out that she was doing just fine. I will learn to try to avoid things that may do me harm. Somebody asks you, uh, I want to do a test. I'll give you an example that happened in my wife's case. <clears throat> uh, there, there, there's something growing. We're not exactly sure what it is. We need to take it out. Before we take it out, we'd like to do a needle biopsy. And my question was, if the needle box bi biopsy comes back positive, will you take it out? He said, yes. If it comes back negative, will you take it out? He said, yes. So no matter what the test results indicate, you're going to take out this tumor because you don't like it growing. He says, yes. I said, in that case, don't give her the test. What? When you take it out, test it then. You can't make the stuff up. So is the test necessary, particularly an invasive test? If you can, and this is going to sound really kind of silly to initially, stay the hell out of hospitals if it is at all possible. Or if you have to go into a hospital, negotiate the shortest possible time that you need to be there. 1.7 million people acquire a bacterial infection in United States hospitals last year, and 99,000 of them died according to the Centers for Disease Control. Have you got that? Whether they had cancer, whether they had diabetes, whatever they had, they went into a hospital without an infection and they acquired an infection when they went in. By the way, if you want to know the reason that they acquired infections, because despite all the attempts to, contra to the contrary, in the majority of hospitals, unfortunately, not in every one, physicians and nurses don't always wash their hands, and they don't always use gloves, and they don't always change their gloves between patients. Hospitals are very dangerous places. I apologize to the American Hospital Association for saying that. Uh, if you have surgery, they're going to tell you to stop taking a drug, negotiate the smallest amount of time if you're on a cancer drug for stopping medical mistakes. Uh, I read an article recently that, and I, I, I can't verify this, that medical mistakes are the third leading cause of death in the United States. I will tell you that the incidence of medical mistakes are staggering. And I learned that from 25 years working for CDC. I learned that as an assistant commissioner of health in New York, and I particularly learned that taking care of my wife and other members of my family. The screw-ups and the mix-ups in hospitals are extraordinary. Great people, talented people, wonderful physicians. We're not talking about evil. We're talking about systems that don't have sufficient coordination and sufficient quality control and sufficient checklist with signs that says, 
Nurse, did you just change your gloves? One final thing I would I would learn in terms of, of trying to avoid things that may do you harm is negative family or negative friends. The one thing that cancer patients do not need are negative people around them. You need positive people. And number 10, if despite everything, uh, Despite the fact that you had the right diagnostic test, despite the fact that you had right, the right treatment, uh, despite the fact you had the right dosage and the right support group and so on, you develop resistance. Uh, and by the way, it is very common. Typically, patients treated with a single drug, particularly if they've had metastatic or advanced cancer, develop resistance to that drug. And so learn everything you can to try to figure out how do you overcome that drug resistance. Is it surgery? Is it a higher dosage of a particular drug? Is it a clinical trial? Is it off-label prescriptions? In other words, a prescription for a drug that's approved, but not for this particular cancer. And I want to circle back and just finish up with clinical trials. Uh, many people who have, who have advanced cancer understandably want to know, is there a clinical trial? And if, you're gonna, if, if, if that's your question, and you have to navigate the clinical trial process, there are a couple of things that you need to keep in mind. Number one, when a doctor offers you a clinical trial, is that the best clinical trial that's available for you in the United States? Or does that happen to be the clinical trial that he's running in his facility? And is that the best trial for you as well? Second, what phase trial is it? Uh, most clinical trials are phase one clinical trials. What does that mean? It means that they're trying to establish the safety level, the drug level for the particular drug. Not trying to establish efficacy. They're trying to figure out whether the drug is safe and at what dosage. And the way they run phase one clinical trials is they start a group of people at the very lowest dosage. Let's say it's 10. And they might put five or 10 people on that and then all is well, they seem, to, they seem to tolerate it. The next group of people go to 20 and so on. And they keep increasing the dosage level until they reach a point of intolerance. And I won't get into the exact mathematical cutoff, but there's a point at which they declare, we can't go any higher than this. So there's a question for your survival as a cancer patient. You wanna ask an oncologist offering you a clinical trial in addition to whether or not it's his trial or the best trial that he thinks is available. And the question that you wanna ask is this, Doc, at what dosage level in this phase one safety trial do you think this drug is likely to help, is likely to work? What's your best guess that at what level do you think this drug is gonna stop working? And he might say, well, Oh, it's a trial, we're not sure. We won't know until we have other phase trials. But if I had to take a best guess, it's probably not 10, 20, it's probably 40. Say to the doctor, that's the group I want to be in. I'll wait for that group. It might be a week later, four weeks later, as they reach a group. Sign me up for the group that you think has the best chance of surviving, not the other groups as well. And if you've gone through all of this, We wish you well. We wish you Godspeed if you have cancer. And if you have a problem, call the life Group. Thank you for listening.